Hi and welcome to my presentation, Eating Disorders and Social Media, Cause for Concern or Untapped Treatment Potential. So firstly, what are eating disorders? They are mental illness characterised by disturbances in eating behaviours resulting from troubling thoughts and feelings. They primarily affect younger people, so teens and young adults, although are evident throughout ages. Um, more women are affected, but the amount of men affected is also on the rise. Um, the main eating disorders are anorexia, which is manifested via self-starvation and a fear of gaining weight. Um, bulimia is a similar preoccupation with weight and losing weight, but however is characterised by binging and subsequent purging to rectify the binge. So this can be via vomiting, lax tears, exercise. And there are others. Binge eating disorder is the most common um, and has only recently been re recognised in current DSM. Um, and there's also some other, um, so anorexia is the most deadly of all psychiatric conditions. The graph on this slide represents the number of hospital admissions with a diagnosis of anorexia by age in the year 2017-18. As you can see, the three highest range ages are between 15 to 29 years. And this is also the age group that most engage in social media. So by social media, um, what do we mean? They are online communities and platforms where users post, share and create content as well as interacting with other users. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and there's some older school forms like blogs, websites and forums are in also included. Um, it's well known that the longer an eating disorder goes on for, the greater the delay in diagnosis and treatment, the more severe the eating disorder is and ha it's harder to treat because it becomes more entrenched. One in eight adults in the UK surveyed had reported suicidal feelings due to body image concerns. So it's quite drastic, you know, and as a society and people, we are putting an awful lot of focus on how our bodies look and it becomes tightly interwoven with our self-worth. So, and this is a culmination of decades of cultural and societal forming. It's nothing new, but social media is. The concern is that image-based media promotes a thin ideal, which people compare themselves to. And if they are unlike this beauty ideal standard, then they often will feel bad about themselves. Um, this is called social comparison theory and it can be negative or positive. Usually in the case of body image, it's a negative social comparison and the hypothesis is that thin bodies in media and representation causes eating disorders and it's not one that I agree with but I do think that social media is a compounding variable in the biopsychosocial model of eating disorder pathology and we'll see why. So. Social media thrives off unhealthy comparisons to other people's curated highlight reels. Photo editing is un not uncommon and strategic posing are well-known techniques for manipulating the image. And frequency of social media use has been positively correlated with depression, anxiety and negative body image and higher rates of disordered eating, which is not quite an eating disorder, but it's not healthy. So social media is a reflection of societal ideals but also of niches, and one niche on this is of pro-ED communities, so pro-eating disorder. And they are communities that promote eating disorder behaviours, cite them as a lifestyle choice, encourage negative social comparisons via thinspiration, which is images of extremely thin people. You can see some of these images here. This is appeals to the really competitive nature of eating disorders, particularly anorexia, which so... Weighing it up, we use this content to inform clinical practice or do we just need to ban it? Um, so weighing it up, you know, other concerns are... the. There's some theories about why and how people are interacting with this content. Um, so there's different levels of engagement, which is a theory, and it correlates with varying degrees of psychopathology in that the more people are engaged, the more psychopathology and symptomology that is severe. So Bakna, Malman et al, 2018, have characterised into three. So non-participatory, so they're just lurking, watching, not engaging. The second is involvement and engagement, which is what most people do with social media. And the third is really involved in eating and weight-based um, sites and forums with specific goals and topics. And the entire site is focused on body image. And that's where more 
online behaviors indulged with eating people with eating disorders correlates positively with symptomology and negatively with measures of psychological health so correlation is not causation and is this perhaps more suggestive of how a poorly brain in a poorly person is operating or is this activity causing the illness and this can get really confusing because eating disorders can also be hidden in wellness culture and wellness culture can promote really unhealthy things so here we have an advert from gym box a upmarket gym in london i don't know if it's uk and the punish yourself buff i mean yeah wow um this is marketed as health and wellness um so the clinical implications of these sites and behaviors and engaging with them so rogers looked into this a bit further and designed an integrated theory that combines five theories and she's called it an integrated model quite aptly um the online interaction with ed, ED content assumes symptomology of three levels is already present so that is social comparisons body surveillance and a thin ideal of internalization um are presumed already so when we think of this model it can be useful to think of it alongside the cycle of change theory which is already implemented in eating sword interventions which is this circle diagram on the right and as we do with current interventions when we consider where the client service user is in the cycle of change from pre-contemplation contemplation preparation making the action maintenance and all the relapses that occur in between um we can think of the activity online as symptomology rather than causation so here this diagram on the left is the model that is integrated through and theoretical of the mechanisms at play within these communities online and within on these sites and that what draws people to them um, so there's three levels of participation and each level of participation is dominated by a particular theory so the first one of lurking and the effects of seeing thin images and this then causing it is a sociocultural theory and the second is for the second and third for the third and the motive for people being on these sites is that the online self feels more strongly correlated with the true self and aspects of the identity that are marginalized and otherwise stigmatized in the offline world. One of the main issues with this is that by all having similar views and ideas, a bubble in an echo chamber, it normalizes and skews eating disorder patho pathology behaviors. This is a proposed barrier to recovery and into treatment seeking related to the most severe forms of eating disorder. How do we modify behavior? How do we address this as healthcare professionals? So the first option is censorship, which was tried initially. Also blocking hashtags. So now when you, you search certain words. Um, so there was one study where Bing adverts from the Bing search engine were, were used and targeted people searching for ED related content. And they directed people either to the National Eating Disorder Association or the National Institute for Mental Health. This is American study or a really mild version of a proana site called my proana which is a forum essentially what they found was that ad exposure to the my proana group greatly increased treatment searches and decreased ed content related searches results i would take this study with a pinch of salt the results were very overstated so now we look at clinical implications so once people are engaged with an intervention how do healthcare professionals currently view the role of online activity in treatment and relevance? So the approaches were categorized into three. Technology isn't relevant and if it comes up, the therapist guides them back to the agenda. The second is is relevant and is explored when the client brings it up themselves. And the third is that it's definitely relevant and is specifically addressed. This approach is more common amongst nutritionists, so perhaps my thought and ideas are quite typical for a nutrition student the authors say there is no right and no wrong and they were just exploring these approaches attitudes and therapeutic outcomes so to conclude the world of pro ed and other such um, communities online could be used as a tool and source of information to broaden training and hcp's understanding of the current landscape of eating disorders amongst young people 
And also young people are engaging with online media a lot because this is essentially their language. So can we use this information to then engage otherwise difficult to reach and perhaps extremely vulnerable young people in a safe and constructive manner? Future directions for research I would suggest would be to identify how and why particular needs are fulfilled online and how this can be incorporated to make more effective and efficient interventions. And how can we engage more people in treatment services earlier in the development of eating pathology? But also, this is pointless if services are not funded to cope. Also, in the mainstream, it is within, is it within our role to challenge unhealthy ideals and the glamorization of eating pathology? I think so, and this is something as a profession that we can all do. So the digital landscape has changed a lot in the last 10 years, but so has real-life consequences of mental health in young people. So with the 70% increase in self-harm admissions and a 285% increase in girls being admitted to hospital for cutting, which is not a separate issue as you may expect from eating disorders, um, they are very intertwined. And just because social media use correlates with these figures does not mean it causes these outcomes. Also in the last 10 years there has been austerity, cuts to youth services, cuts to schools, cuts to mental health services for youth and adults, increased child poverty, increased youth violence and not, so nothing is occurring independently of anything else. The wider picture is so important because stress, lack of control, emotional instability, abuse, neglect etc are all contributory factors in the development of an eating disorder. Thanks for watching. Um,